I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Hey, hey, what's up, world? Welcome to another special edition of I Mix What I Like Live. And we're just going to get right into it with, with those who are already here because we have a big night with a lot of important people. Uh, I'm very excited to catch up with, uh, to have this discussion to commemorate, not, of course, the assassination of Malcolm X, but to commemorate Malcolm himself on this day, uh, this anniversary of his assassination in 1965. And to do that, uh, I'm very happy to have been able to pull together a, a, a round table of at least a majority or a good handful of the contributors to A Lie of Reinvention, Correcting Manning Marable's Malcolm X, co-edited by myself and Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs, who joins me this evening, along with Dr. Patricia Reed Merritt and Dr. Sundiata Chajua. And we are expecting many others to come on through in the next I don't know, 60, 90 minutes or so, we'll see. Uh, and uh, uh, what I hope to do, and we'll ask our, our guests what, what their hopes and expectations are, I would like us to talk a little bit about the, the history of the project and what's gone on since it's been published. Uh, and I have not had a chance to talk with everybody who will be here tonight, so I have some questions for them about their responses and interpretations and experiences themselves. But, but first, welcome to everybody. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining me and us. It's good to see you all. Thank you. Good to be, good to be here. Uh, so just quickly, um, uh, uh, Dr. Patricia Reed Merritt is, among many other things, an author and educator, scholar, and performing artist. She is a distinguished professor of social work and Africana studies at Richard Stockton College in Galway Township, New Jersey. Uh, and she was one of the, uh, the, the contributors to our project here. Uh, Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs, you all know, is a, a freelancer and regular contributor to, to I Mix What I Like. He's got a forthcoming uh, incredible project that I cannot wait for us to get into at some point uh, about Mumia uh, uh, Abu Jamal. His work can be found at drumsintheglobalvillage.com uh, and a nationally syndicated black journalist and, and uh, old friend of mine. And, uh, uh, you know, good to see him back with us as well. Uh, Dr. Sundiata Chajiwa is, you are, have, th this bio is a little outdated. You are on some other level uh, at this point, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of your professorship in the Department of History and African American Studies at the University of Illinois. Uh, um, can you correct and update me on, 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 on this bio that I'm looking at from, from our book that, that no, needs obvious still... update? I am still an associate professor. Okay, but but you are. But I had thought. Okay, maybe I miss. Okay, maybe my memory Testing is messed up. Opinion. I thought. Yeah, come out. You're here, man. You're live, man. Turn your camera on. <coughs> Get, <coughs> all right. Well, let, let me. Kamal got some new equipment, so we'll, we'll bring him back in a minute. No, uh, soon you have to me. I thought I for some reason I thought that that that. Anyway, I thought something else, so forgive me. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, fine. Yeah. Anyway, but you also have a column, and you're also going to be coming a contributor to the Black Power Media Project um, with a show that you're developing with us as well. So I wanted to, to definitely uh, remind folks of that. And uh, 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 again, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and let me say that uh, Barry Francis Barry, VP Franklin, and I have uh, just finished a book on a reparation. So we're looking mm. to see that move forward. Oh, definitely can't wait to see that and, and have you back to talk more about that as well. Uh, and Kamal Franklin, obviously, uh, our, our comrade, uh, among many other things, working with us with the Black Power Media uh, Collective, uh, co-host with Renegade Culture, uh, longtime activist now with Community Movement Builders. Uh, and what I think is very timely for our conversation tonight, among many other things that we could talk about in terms of Kamal's work, uh, but he's a longtime attorney and grassroots community activist, but he specifically was, at least for a time, an attorney for Thomas 15X Johnson, who uh, mm -hmm. is right in the news again, um, you know, uh, being sort of, a, uh, I don't know, he was mentioned in the, we'll talk about it, mentioned in the press conference of, of uh, 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 Earl Wood. I think you're Earl or Eugene Wood, the, the nephew of Raymond Wood. Uh, anyway, so we'll talk about that. So, so very excited. And then now just joining us is the founder and 
head man, Black Classic Press, former Black Panther. Uh, even has a pretty famous son. <laughs> <laughs> Paul the, Coates. The, the thing I'm most impressed about with Paul Coates is the first time I went to that um, um, <laughs> printing shop, you could eat off the floor. I mean, that's how clean it was. I mean, I was, right just, I, was I was just like, man, look at this, look at this place. No wonder this man is always smiling. I'm I'm glad you didn't eat off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> we may have had some COVID going on before. Now. So I'm just glad you didn't. I'm glad to join you guys. I was I was actually on the wrong thing. I clicked the wrong link and so I ended up somewhere else. So thank you guys. That might have been my fault. I hope that wasn't my fault. It, it, there's so many links getting thrown around, so I apologize for that. Uh, I definitely apologize for. That. You know, we were just giving some basic introductions. I mean, I have, I, you know, I have a, a, a questions that I have for you all. Uh, uh, but, but maybe Paul, we should just start with you because one of the questions is just, just why did this project come to be? From your perspective and your memory of of, of pulling this together, why, why did you think it was necessary? Jared, what, what I remember most is being incensed by it. I mean, I was just, I was bubbling when I when I got the book and all the attention the book was getting, and then I look inside this book and it's crap. And I don't remember, Jared. I I I knew you, of course. And I knew your fire, but I'm trying to remember, I don't think at the time I had seen anything by you, but immediately you came to mind. And immediately when I called you, you told me, <laughs> gosh, you almost exploded on the phone also, because you and Todd, I believe, had been doing things around this for a while. And um, you schooled me on it. and. I believe from there, we knew that we had a connection. And I knew that I'd hooked up with a team that could really get the job done. I've never fancied myself or considered myself as a writer, really as a reader. And knowing you as a writer, knowing Todd as a writer, I just knew that we could get this done, you know, lending our, our stuff. And you guys, I, I mean, the work you did still stands the test of time. The people you collected and brought together stand the test of time, you know? Paul, that's, that's very humble. You taught us a lot about writing and reading and publishing in that year it took for that book. So I appreciate the humility, but I, I, I felt like I grew as a writer just fighting with you right over <laughs> this book. And, and I so appreciate uh, what you did for us. Thank you. And I, and I appreciate, and let me just say openly to Dr. Ball, I, I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of that project uh, because uh, there were so many other people in the Africana world you could have chosen. Uh, and, you know, choosing a comic book geek like me, you know, I really appreciated that. <laughs> and and I was well, glad I mean, to be part of that project. Well, we already were working together. We already were friends. And and uh, and and the joke that I know that we all had developed was that that you know there was only a handful of us that were willing to go down with the ship over a project like this. <laughs> so, you know, it's like you know, I mean, you know, and, and honestly, you know, and that was something I definitely want to ask you all about in terms of your thoughts about it because there were a number of people that we reached out to who didn't want to be involved and and not because they disagreed, but they didn't want to be publicly, you know, uh, on the chopping block with something like this. Um, Baba Zakondo, welcome, by the way. We, you know, I just want to acknowledge that you, you, you are here. Thank you very much for showing up. Uh, and I, the, the one or two people out there who can't possibly might not know who you are, uh, a legendary uh, Africana scholar and, and author of, of, Conspiracies Unraveling the Assassination of Malcolm X, which is for many of us the foundational book uh, on the assassination. Uh, so so we're, we're just sort of uh, opening up with some initial thoughts here. Um, I, I don't necessarily want to lead everything, but but uh, uh, if you know, I, I could start with some some other questions. If, if any of you have anything that you wanted to start with or any pressing comments or questions or reflections about being on the project, uh, uh, I'm happy to have any of you start. Um, uh, Let me start then. Uh, please. Uh, uh, this was not something that I expected to do. Uh, one of the reasons why I was able to do it, probably because I didn't know any better in regards to what kind of reaction people might have. <laughs> uh, I happen to be one of the contributing writers to Black Classic Press. 
uh, was a few years after I completed Righteous Self-Determination, the Black Social Work Movement in America. And I got a email probably from Paul saying, we're doing this project, we're looking for people and we want you to be one of the contributors. Uh, now I did pick up the book, I read the book and thankfully I was pissed off too. <laughs> I said, goodness grief, you know? And I, I, I mean, I was not a uh, close associate of Manny Marable, but you know, we're, I'm in New Jersey, he was in New York. He had been down to my campus a couple of times and I couldn't imagine what was on his mind. I mean, like what, what made you do this? And in my piece, you know, I write about, you know, the transformation of Malcolm X. But in my piece, I started out by saying the one thing the two of them had in common was neither are here to defend themselves. And so it was unfortunate, you know, of course, Malcolm was gone, but it was unfortunate that Manny died as soon as the book was released, because I would have loved to have had a dialogue with him about tell me the purpose of this. You know, why, why are you doing this? Why are you doing it? And so when I was invited to do it, you know, I didn't hesitate after I had a chance to um, read the book. And I thought, yes, you know, I have something to say. I have a lot to say. Let me get it into this one, you know, um, paragraph. And I have been very happy with my association with this project. And so I do know that at my university and, and Jared, yes, <coughs> since that last bio, you know, from the book, it's actually Stockton University is no longer Richard Stockton college, but that's, that's another issue. But uh, at my university, some of the classes um, do use the book. And so, you know, here we are a few years out and people are still saying this is something that's worthwhile. We can take a look. At that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, somebody, I don't, I'm not really sure. I just want to respond quickly to a question I saw. I don't, I'm not really sure, but, uh, uh, um, but the, 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 the book we're talking about is Manning Marable's A Life of Reinvention. Uh, in terms of the book we were all focused on, the book we have all gathered to to, to create is a, a lie of reinvention, correcting Manning Marable's Malcolm X, which is a title I think we should come back and talk about at some point too. But, but in terms of the reaction that we all got, uh, uh, but anybody else want to want to jump out there with their first thoughts? Uh, and, or, I'll or jump anything? out really quickly. Um, sure. uh, you know, because I I think I got involved after I already wrote a piece because I was so outraged, right? No one, had, no one asked me to write anything. I just read the book and I was so sort of outraged at what I thought was um, Manny Marable's attempt to, you know, I think as I phrase it, to sort of a second assassination, ivory tower assassination of Malcolm X mm -hmm. because it, it seemed to be an obvious repositioning of Malcolm uh, to be acceptable to a neoliberal world um, and neoliberal leaders and a certain class of leaders and to replace the autobiography as the premier text in which mm -hmm. people go to study and read about Malcolm and making Manning again then the premier person to speak the truth about who Malcolm was and who Malcolm wasn't and what Malcolm was becoming and who Malcolm would have become. And I and it seemed to be so many obvious flaws in suggesting that he would have supported Obama, his views on Islam, um, his, his views on radical Islam even, um, and then all the sort of peculiar, non-footnoted, um, sort of sleazy innuendos about Malcolm's life. It's, and, and again, it seemed to be one of these books that when it's written and it has this critical lens of someone like a Malcolm X, it gets embraced by mainstream media. The New York Times all of a sudden wants to do a review of the book about Malcolm X, something they, they prior wouldn't touch for the most part, unless again, it's some sort of critical review. So I think all of that built up around someone like me who was born a few years after Malcolm's assassination, but uh, probably like a lot of folks, uh, my generation, 80s, 90s, got politicized off of hearing Malcolm's speeches and reading the autobiography. And that's you know why I got involved in movement politics, felt like I wanted to contribute to some response. And so I was happy to be a part of the book and to be able just to write down some thoughts and some some ideas around where I think the book was flawed. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just, wanted, I could just add one thing to that. Oh, go right ahead. No, go ahead. If mm -hmm. I could just add one thing to that. The thing that I came away with, you know, after um, reading the book and all of the discussion, is that somehow or another I, I felt like Manny felt like we were all suffering from hero worshiping. And that he, he had to set the record straight that for for the two generations after um, Malcolm was assassinated. You know, he grew, his image grew, his influence grew. And I felt like Manny was saying to us, it's too much of this hero worshiping going on. Let's back up and rewrite the story. And that's sort of what I came away um, with. 
I, I'm, I'm glad you said that <laughs> because I wanted to follow up on both of those things quickly and, and say this before I forget. I think what you just said about Manning, I think that's what biographers do, right? And I'm a fan of biography. I'm a huge fan of biography. Biography is mostly the most of the history I read. I'm not a fan of bad biography. I'm not a fan of, of biography <laughs> that's not well researched. I'm not a fan of biography that's that's not uh, proven, right? I mean, we can argue about David Levering Lewis's, for instance, uh, a penchant for commentary, right? But we can't mm. just argue about the fact that he went to seven continents for Du Bois, right? Whether we like what he wrote about Du Bois or not, right? Mm. We may not be fans of David Garrow, right? We may, we may or may not. I'm, I'm, I am. But we may not. Some may not be. Mm. But. Mm. When he did 2,000 interviews on Obama, he did 2,000 interviews on Obama. And not only did he do 2,000 interviews, he read every single article written about Obama and had a whole critique of the articles and critiqued journalists <laughs> for, their, for their laziness in terms of parroting the line. The, 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 notes, the notes in Gary, David Garrow's book on Obama could be its own book, right? Mm -hmm. So... When you have a world historical figure by, 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 like Malcolm X, you're supposed to rip him down, but you're supposed to rip him down in context. I, I just read a book, a uh, biography mm. of Stan Lee, the, the co-creator of Marvel Comics, and the guy is saying he's barely the co-creator. He may not even be that. I mean, because this dude ripped Stan Lee apart, right? But he got all the documentation. He, he interviewed 150 people, so he knew he was talking about, right? So... My problem with Manning Marable and Les Payne, both of them, is that they waited way too long and got way too old. Hello there. Hello there. Hi, I see you. Hi. All right. They, they, um, they waited too long and they got way too old to do something serious. So instead of doing something serious, they decided to make a buck. And that's why I attacked both of them um, because Malcolm X as a world historical figure deserves a real biography, a real biography where you mm. interview a hundred to a thousand people, where you go to Mecca and you go find the documents in Mecca about, you know, where he went and what he did, a real biography. And instead of getting a real biography, we have these, uh, and I'm going to say it, sorry, Paul, baby boomer celebrities who think that they created the universe. And because they created the universe, they get to write biographies without having to do any of the work that that, uh, that Joe Smo from like New York Magazine would have to do, right? Um, and they get rewarded for it because of who they are. Uh, Manning Marable got the Pulitzer Prize. Well, who gives out the Pulitzer Prize? Columbia University. Where did Manning Marable <laughs> teach? Columbia University. Who are all the people that defended Manning Marable when the book came out? All those people, you look at all those people, they got grants. So who did they get grants from? Manning Marable, where did they go and have visiting professorships at? Columbia University, right? So you have that aspect. Then with Les Payne, well, he's the greatest black investigative journalist in the 20th century. He solved the Tawana Brawley case. Well, we've got to just give him this just because. And I'm like, no, either you do a biography or you don't. This cannot be tolerated because our his world historical figures, particularly someone like Malcolm X, and, and, and look, I want to disagree with some of you here. The autobiography is, is really more, the more I read these biographies of Malcolm X, the autobiography is a fiction piece. Now you may like it, you may have been inspired by it, but it's a fiction piece, right? So um, it, it's as fictive as, you know, um, Zora Neale Hurston's Tracks on the Road, right? It's fictive. It, but it's an autobiography. It's not. It's not imposed as a definitive historical Pulitzer Prize winning institutional. So an autobiography is. You can excuse, from my point of view, some of those flaws. No, but, you but can do what you want autobiography. But I'm just saying it's a work of fiction, and particularly when we look at how the, the autobiography of Malcolm X was created, everybody yeah. had an agenda. Haley had an agenda. Uh, uh, Doubleday had an agenda, and Malcolm had an agenda, and they all came together to create a work of art. That would okay. sell. But right. Malcolm couldn't have an agenda in the in the Viking press book. <laughs> right, that's true. That's true. So I just want to say, I just want to say, mm -hmm. so we need a real biography because I think it's important to know what the construction of the autobiography is. And even though we may be inspired by it, I still want to know, okay, what's the reality behind it, right? And we have not had that purposely 
because white hegemony is not interested in black nationalism, pan-Africanism, or socialism, mm -hmm. and they are not going to fund a major black scholar or a major white scholar to go do the real work on Malcolm X, and that angers me to no end. Uh, so I just wanted to say that uh, while I had it in my head. And now, now I'm going to be quiet. The first thing I'm going to say is I was wondering why you were apologizing to me. Right. Yeah, I, I was trying to figure that out too. So why was you? Why were you apologizing? Yeah, the baby boomer, something I don't relate to. All right, I, 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 I didn't know the range. This thing, man. Okay, that's good. That's good. No, because I mean, I mean, because you know, there's a whole, there's a whole. Todd. Here, here's what occurs to me, one thing, and I just want to throw this at you, because I don't buy the autobiography is fictive, okay? Does it have fiction in it? What does it have yeah. in it? But yeah, that's what autobiographies are. But I'm saying with the same standard that you set for the biography, you'd have to set that same standard for yourself to call it fictive. And I, I really want you to get that because like it's the closest thing that we do have at least mm -hmm. malcolm we know that malcolm mm -hmm. participated in it to some extent mm -hmm. the rest of that stuff we know he did not participate in so is it is it flawed is it problematic does it you know does it have elements of fiction i agree but i think for us to walk away and for us to be satisfied with a declaration of fiction we have to apply the same the requirements that you require for bi biography, would we not? Well, you know, I, I, I'll say this. I, I respect what you, I respect what you're saying, Paul. But but I'll, I'll say it this way: When I read the two volume work on Langston Hughes done by Arnold Rampersand, sure. One of the mm -hmm. things that he documented was he documented that Langston Hughes said to his publisher, "If you want me to do," he said two things that I think make both of us right here. He said. If you want me to, he said to the publisher, if, if, if you want me to write an autobiography, I'll write it, but you better pay for me documenting everything because I'm not, I'm not going to go do the research for free, right? So we actually went and did the research on his life, allegedly, right? Okay. And, and, and I think that makes me right, but I think what makes you right is that Langston Hughes wrote a letter to somebody talking about his, his two autobiographies, and he said, you know, this thing is really kind of a sham because <laughs> all you're doing is you're putting the most exciting parts of your life together that, that people want to read and it makes you ha have this exciting life that you really didn't have, right? So so the, the needs of the narrative, right, create a certain degree of fiction, which I think yeah. is is inherent in the in the genre, in the genre mm -hmm. of autobiography. I think that that's just a part of, of what it is. And, and we're not even going to go into, you know, how people now do the narrative nonfiction techniques of composite characters and uh, uh, scenes switching around, which everybody does, including President Obama. He did that, right? So we're not even going to go into all of that. But I, but I think it's important to say that the autobiography comes out of Playboy magazine, and Malcolm goes to Playboy magazine with this with a conversion story he wants to tell. And he tells that story, and that's how Double Day is interested. And then he tells that story again. Now, Les Payne did one positive thing before he got sick and died. He documented evidence that Malcolm X's father was not killed by the local Ku Klux Klan, that it was an accident, mm -hmm. and that Malcolm was the only family member who kept that story alive. And the other family members uh, have either disavowed it or don't talk about it. So. I'm just saying that, that the more I read these biographies, the, the, the documentation that has been done makes the autobiography go further and further into fiction. All right, but let I, me, let, let me, I, I just want to make sure that we at least hear from Sundiata and Baba Zach one time before, before the debate continues, uh, 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 <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and including just my one transition comment that, that Malcolm was not assassinated because he was the only one to keep that story alive. That's the only thing that I would want to point out in other. So, so <laughs> Brother Sundiata, uh, uh, let me, you know, jump in here real quick and, and, yeah. So I'll start where uh, everyone else started. Uh, I too had written something before and was part of uh, the project at the Black Scholar to take up um, the Marable book. Now for me, I, I'm probably positioned in relationship to Marable different than everyone else here. 
uh, I had known uh, Manning since like 1988. Mm -hmm. And um, I was part of the leadership of the Black Radical Congress. And to some degree was brought in by Manning. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I have a sense of Manning's history that I do think is honorable and should be credited, but the book was bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, I also don't believe Maribel wrote the book. That's two of us, yeah. Okay, uh, one we know for certain, there's interviews where Manning says that um, each chapter was sent to the editor. Mm -hmm. And then she would make comments on, on trying uh, how to make it more, uh, popular, which meant sensational, so that it would make money, right? Um, and we know that, in, in fact, that editor in an interview tells the story that when Manning is rushed to the hospital the week that he dies, that he's literally on the gurney and he's saying that he's going to make edits. So, so we're down to that point. And we know that his wife, Leith, is the last well, I don't think she's a left one, but we know that she was tasked with uh, bringing the book together. Now, what I think happened, at least the way I read it, because when you read the book, you can see that there are things that suggest that, well, this is the way Manning Marable mind works. And then you see passages where you say, this is some undergraduate student that didn't finish the course they had with Manning, mm -hmm. right? And then you can see, other things that seem to be written by other people. Uh, so I think that we got to put all of that in the mix. And I do think that Manning thought, having always having to deal with the criticism that he didn't go to the archives, he thought he invented a methodology that would erase that criticism for, for entirety. So what he tried to do was put together this research team. I can tell you, you don't want historians based on their training to put together research teams. Social scientists are used to working collaboratively mm. and they manage those kinds of things. Historians for the most part are long wolves. And unless they are brought out of that kind of uh, approach early, they're not gonna do good managing the research team. And so what we find is that there are things that should have been summaries that were given to Manning to then go back in, revise and contextualize that make their way into the text of the book. And you can see very clearly that this is a note from a graduate student or undergraduate student. So I think we got that problem, but I do think that Manning was so intent on having a, winning a Pulitzer that he sacrificed principle on some very clear questions with that editor, because anytime an editor tells you we got to go chapter by chapter, that's a, and particularly a senior scholar who's published like, I don't know, uh, a book every three years of their life. That's suspicious. Can, can so I just I do say fault one? Manning there, and 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 and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. there, there's no doubt that mm -hmm. he never went abroad and looked at archives. He. he uh, he never really investigated the African piece. And so, there, there, you know, there's the book clearly should have not been marketed as a definitive autobiography. Mm -hmm. And it's a poor piece of, mm -hmm. of scholarship. There's, there's no doubt about that. But there are some things in the book that I do think uh, are, 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 are worthy. It's just that there are too few. I just want to take 10 seconds and follow up on what Cindy had said, because this is important. I, I went and did the research. Manning Marable wrote or edited 13 books between the period of time he said he decided to do the autobi the biography mm -hmm. and when the biography came out. Now, we know Manning Marable is a writing machine, right? You know, he had that mm -hmm. column forever and all that kind of stuff, right? You cannot, even if you're a writing machine, even if you're at Columbia, you cannot do edit or write 13 books and write a serious biography. There's just no way in doing it. No, no, no. Here's what I'm trying to say, Todd. Manny Marable was not capable of doing a book built around the archives. If you look at everything Manning did, it's written about, he's analyzing secondary sources, right? Mm -hmm. Even in the Du Bois book, 
There's no primary research done by Manny Marable. He never did primary research. He's not Jerry Horn. Horn does primary right, research. Right, right. And Manning was a writing machine, but he always think of Manning as a journalist, a historical journalist. Don't think of him as a historian in the sense that he's going to delve into primary documents, sift through primary documents. He's going to compare documents across. The, he's, that's not what he's ever done in his career, but that's the task he set because he, he thought this book would end all criticism and it would produce uh, the kind of lasting fame and respect from the historical community that he had been denied. So you're saying he pioneered what Michael Eric Dyson has made an industry off of, which is the bio-criticism. Well, Manning smart, was smart. <laughs> but, but, oh man, that's so tempting. Uh, it is, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but, but, Baba Zach, man, first of all, welcome. Good evening. Um, yeah, how, how's everybody doing? <laughs> do you do you want to just get in where you fit in, or uh, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm 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 interested in 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 any reflections you've had on you know since uh, our work has come out, or or just uh, since maybe the Netflix piece, or, or or where you are, just or anything that's been said today. Right. Where, where, where? Yeah, actually, I, I think I want to chime in with some of what's been you know discussed and uh debated before i go there though uh what i wanted to share ordinarily like when this project that uh paul you know had um you know um suggested um when it was when y'all first went there and and i remember you you know you contacted me about it um i'm one of those brothers that's apprehensive about us doing, you know, what I would normally call reactionary, um, you know, research. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe in proactionary. But there's been some cases in which I think reactionary, you know, is important for struggle. Uh, one case that comes to mind off the top: William William Styron's uh, uh, Nat, Nat Turner. Turner, Ten Black Writers Respond. Uh, that was needed, that was necessary, you know, you're trying to correct, you know, some extraordinary, you know, policies and injustices. I think this was also one of those times when it was necessary. Mm -hmm. So I commend, um, you know, Paul and, you know, the rest of y'all for, you know, coming forth and, you know, putting in the time and the energy. Uh, otherwise, Marable would have you know, there wouldn't have been much alternative as far as, you know, biography is concerned uh, with regard to, uh, to man, you know, to uh, Marable. Um, the other thing that I did want to share, too, uh, when you were talking about the whole autobiography thing, I think that um, I pretty much uh, follow Paul on this. I think that the autobiography is flawed, but, but it's not fiction. Um, what we do know about the autobiography is that Malcolm and Alex Haley certainly had a relationship. I think the major, what makes the autobiography problematic for me is the fact that we have to rely upon Alex Haley, Alex Haley's credibility. And I think Alex Haley consistently proved that he had a credibility problem. Now, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I know that when he was doing Roots, I think he ended up paying out of pocket somewhere in the neighborhood of about a, half, a million and a half yeah. dollars from scholars and researchers who he would talk to and they would give him information and then it would appear in his book as if it was part yeah. of his oral history. You know, yeah. Alex Haley was not a credible um, source for me. And so... When I was younger, I didn't notice, I didn't understand as I got older and I began to know the mechanics of how the book was published. And then the, I guess the major thing that bothers me about the autobiography is that Malcolm never read it in its finality. You know, Alex Haley had given him a couple copies here and there, and he gave it back to Alex Haley with a lot of red marks. Alex Haley didn't like that. Alex Haley also didn't like the fact that you know, 
Malcolm started wanting to use the autobiography, which by the way, it is his damn story, but he, but he, according to Alex Haley, Malcolm wanted to use it more and more as a club against Elijah Muhammad. And so he, he wanted to try to keep the original, you know, format, the original direction of it. And he thought that Malcolm was going to taint it or I don't know how you taint a damn autobiography. That's his story. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, um, and so when you factor those in, when it comes to the autobiography, you know, so my thing is this, I view the autobiography as largely a, um, an honorable source, but you footnote it by just reminding people that it has flaws, that Malcolm didn't do this and that and those types of things. But I still think that the stories themselves are pretty much, you know, still coming coming from Malcolm. Um, obviously, you know, if, you know, the afterthought I thought was real interesting. According to Malcolm, they had, and uh, according to Haley, they had an agreement that he could, you know, do his own thoughts afterwards and stuff. That's probably the most authentic part of the autobiography is Alex Haley basically, you know, giving you his opinion of their relationship and all of those types of things and stuff. So, you know, I, I guess, um, you know, uh, when all is said and done, I'm glad that we have an autobiography of Malcolm X. I know for me, it changed my life. Uh, you know, when I read it, you know, when I was 12, I mean, it put me in a whole different trajectory. But I think it's important that we also just acknowledge its flaws and get what we can get from it. Uh, but let's not, you know, let's not overdo it. If it's okay, right on. To, uh, just to jump in really quickly, uh, you know, uh, you know, from a, uh, a non-scholar point of view, because I'm a non-scholar, um, lawyer, you know, uh, more activist organizer, the, you know, the one thing that we can say about the autobiography, that if it, if it was the intent of Haley and or others to uh, make Malcolm less political or to make a safe Malcolm from, from the autobiography, they failed because through yeah. the autobiography, literally, we can't even understate this, millions of people have been politicized, have become activists, have become organizers. So even within the sort of the, you know, in the way in which we're talking about it, if the purpose from Malcolm's point of view was to activate people around a certain history, um, whether or not it's sort of, you know, obviously it's important to scholarly document and so forth. But if Malcolm's purpose was to project something so that folks could take in a story, read it, and get something, get something out of it that made them more attuned to how the world work, how we as black people fit in the world, and what is the organizing activism, uh, nation building structures uh, that we have to build to get out of it. Uh, if someone was trying to stop that, then they failed miserably because um, for all it, it could have been, what it was was something that became sort of a perfect storm to really politicize people within a certain time period that has lasted, I can't even say a certain time period, that since the time it was published, um, has still today done that work that Malcolm, you know, at the time you know, when he was fighting to either save his life or know that the, the, the end was near, knew that that would be the lasting piece that he would be able to offer to the world to hear some version of his story before others jumped in. Um, later, Barabo, I talk about um, George Brittman, um, and, and they begin to give you the Malcolm that they want you to have, that brings people to their stories and what they want you to follow. So I think it's important to note too, that the autobiography uh, was as close as we got, as, as uh, Baba Zach was saying, to something that Malcolm wanted to project onto the world for us to understand the relationship of us as a people vis-a-vis -vis America and white supremacy. You know what? When I read the autobiography, it changed my life, but more than changing my life, it gave me insight into how to analyze my life, right? And what I discovered later, when I read uh, Bill Cross's Negro to Black Conversion, that came out in July in, uh, in Black World 1971, and, and Cross's pulling from Fanon, particularly Wretched of the Earth, where Fanon talks about alien and alienization and all of the ways in which one decolonizes the mind, but cross crystallized that, that method of you have an encounter, 
And that encounter, that racist encounter finally sparks you to come to understand the social meaning of blackness. And so then you plunge into a black world, right? You begin to read African black history. You begin to join organizations, those kinds of things. Well, Alcom's life mirrors Cross's Negressin's model before the model was developed. Wow. In fact, I would argue that reading the autobiography along with Fanon helped Cross, and I'll have to ask him, crystallize that model. So for me, uh, the fictive aspects of the autobiography work because it crystallizes a story in a compelling way that allows us to see a deep insight into the black experience and the way in which we become black. And what's more profound is that what Malcolm describes and what Cross crystallizes into a, a psychological theory, you don't see that in the autobiography of Frederick Douglass. You don't see that in Ida B. Wells. You don't see that in any of the autobiographies that are published before the 1960s. But in the 1960s, Asada, the same thing. So for me, getting that, I don't give a damn if it's all made up. <laughs> getting that, <laughs> you, you, you understand, is so necessary for us. and lays the groundwork to begin to talk about liberation activities because you've got to transform the individual in the process of struggle. And that's what the autobiography does and that's why it's the most stolen book in the history of the New York Public Library. Oh, wow. I, would have to, I would have to agree with you. I agree because I think, again, for me, you know, social scientists, you know, the focus has to be on transformation. You know, is there a story here that really talks about a transformation? And yes, the autobiography does that, which is why for me, uh, Manny's book was more disturbing. Because his book is attempting to say all that transformation stuff is bullshit. You know, here's the real story. You got you to gotta hang on to this other stuff, which was far more salacious. You know, some attempt to say, well, look, you didn't know all this juicy stuff was going on, too. I think the other thing that's really important is the extent to which the autobiography has been consumed by the, the general public. Uh, I don't think that was ever going to happen, you know, with uh, Manny's book. Uh, nor would it happen with our our contradictions, our book that says we want to contradict them. You know, this was this. I mean, autobiography was something that really appealed to the average kind of person. They they could pick up, let's like say, as a twelve year old, as a twenty year old, whatever, and say, I can identify with this story. This story has significant meaning to me, and I think it was because it is because so many of us have been touched by his transformation in reading that story, much of which I think really does reflect the life that he lived, we're able to embrace, we were able to embrace Malcolm the way we have been able to embrace him and, and hold him up in high esteem. And again, as I said earlier, uh, perhaps one of the things that Manny's autobiography wanted to do was to say, y'all, holding this person up in too high esteem and we got to sort of bring them down to the earthly level. If... And I, this is where I definitely agree with Sundiata. If he, in fact, was was that uh, conscious and aware of the final product, and 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 we couldn't at the time, I felt it, but we couldn't. I, certainly, I don't think we could make the argument in in print. Um, but in the years since, uh, listening to Wendy Wolf, the the editor, and her presentations on the book, uh, um, and seeing the the feeble condition Marable was in mm -hmm. in his, in that last video where he's holding up the book. Uh, I, 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 I could easily see how he wouldn't have been able to be uh, aggressive or, or competently, you know, involved enough. Uh, and, and then also politically, it's a departure from so much of his other work. So that, that's mm -hmm. why I, it, that's the other thing that was, was, was always struck me as a problem with, with what, what was done with this book. But I just want to say, I'm very glad that we did this uh, because I, you know, I was confident, and I think we, it, it's been shown to be correct, that, that, that Marable's book would be echoing negatively for years. Uh, and I was wanting to have us be part of, of, of documenting some sort of attempt to resist and, and, and challenge it. So I like it. And Todd, I think you pointed this out to me. I like when you go to Wikipedia and find, uh, you know, the Marable book, our book is listed. Mm -hmm. uh, 
even when Netflix hated on us. And, and Baba Zach, I definitely want to ask you about this because I was, I'm not going to lie, I was so, I was just, I, not at you, obviously. I would never be mad at you. But I was mad to see that you and Brother Bailey were in there uh, and, and to see what was done. So I would definitely want to ask you about that because, because there's that one scene, and personally I was offended that they did it in D.C. at Sankofa Books that I spent many years building in that spot, many years working with people in that <laughs> spot, never saw none of the brothers involved with the Netflix documentary in that space, but they come and use that space to hate on us where you see him, uh, uh, you know, they have the two books, ours and Marable's juxtaposed on the shelf. And it's a quick scene where they go in and they, 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 they grab Marable's book and say, no, this is the one you want. <laughs> And I was just like, man, that is so. And and meanwhile, they're interviewing Brother Bailey and and Baba Zach as keynote historians for the piece. Uh, anyway, so so so. Uh, uh, anyway, my point is, I'm very glad. Paul, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to just uh, yeah. Zach. Can I just ask Jerry something real quick? Because he said something. He said uh, he would yeah. never be mad at you. He said he would never be mad. I've never heard him say that before. <laughs> so that's nice. That's all I want to say, Jared. Go Imagine ahead. me getting mad at Bob Zach. That would be insane. I, no, the point. The point is the point. I was mad at how I thought that they were doing him and the rest of us. That's what I thought. So, so, and then Baba, when you said what you said in your initial response to when you saw the Netflix piece. I, I felt vindicated, but anyway, please, if you would talk a little bit about maybe that experience, and then anything else about how how you know, the response you've seen to 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 your work or our work or any of this. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. First off, the net the Netflix piece. If if I could, I would airbrush every scene that I was in it. Mm -hmm. I regret it was a mistake on my part. You know, I've been in a lot of, uh, you know, documentaries, Malcolm, the Black Panthers, different things like that. This is the only documentary that I've ever been in that I realized it was a mistake. But I didn't know it was a mistake in part because I didn't do my homework. The mm -hmm. first mistake that I made, and normally I would do this, and I can't figure out why I didn't do it this time, is I would figure I would find out who the producer was. I didn't. Uh, I knew that the people who were doing the filming and stuff. I talked to them, and I knew some of their other work, some of which I didn't, you know, really appreciate. It. But I didn't find out. I didn't find out until they had filmed me. At the end of the last filming is when I realized that Skip Gates was the producer. And we've had this conversation, Jared. If I would have known that Skip Gates yeah. was behind yeah. that film, when they first contacted me, I would have said hell no. to the no. But I didn't know that. And so I, I have to I have to live with that. Hmm. Okay. Um you know because I don't I don't trust you know I don't trust Gates. I don't you know I don't you know I, I've seen his documentaries I, I don't respect him, you know, as an African scholar, because I don't think he considers himself an African scholar. I think he considers himself a scholar who happens to be black. So I don't have no time for Skip Gates. But if I would have known, knowing his commercialization history and mm -hmm. other things, no discussion was needed. I would have called it a day. But I didn't know that. I also had no idea what angle they were coming from. You know, because mm. all I did, you know, and they interviewed me twice. I, I went up to Brooklyn one time and they interviewed me like most of the day. And then they came to my college and they interviewed me all day. They came at around 7, 7.15. I had a class at 8 o'clock. They came into the classroom and they basically stayed with me until 7.30 that night. Mm. And I spent mm. the bulk of that time talking about the FBI and the NYPD and their role in Malcolm's assassination. And when they interviewed me in Brooklyn, I spent the bulk of the time talking about the nation, the FBI and the NYPD. So I'm thinking, you know, that, you know, I'm giving them some good stuff. 
And then when I see the film, I'm there all day yeah. at my college. And when I see the film, they had 10 seconds. They showed a scene where we were sitting down at my desk. Muhammad was sitting next to me. I guess he was asked, he asked the question, something like that. And then that was pretty much it. But that wasn't the worst part, you know. I can deal with that. The worst part about that film is that, and it's real clear, you know, now what Gates and whoever funded it, what they were really all about. It was about basically showing the nation of Islam's role in Malcolm's assassination. It was about simplifying Malcolm's assassination as complex as it was. They wanted to simplify it to make the point that maybe possibly behind the scenes, the FBI might have, you know, did a little bit here and there, but they had nothing to do with the, with the actual assassination. Same thing to the NYPD. Um, that was the political angle of that film. And see, my thing is this, and, you know, and, you know, I, I don't need to say this to y'all, but the nation deserves to be, you know, pulled out there. No mm -hmm. problem with that. That's what I do in my book. Mm -hmm. But how the hell can you put all this emphasis on the nation, but you ignore all of the disruptive tactics that the FBI and the NYPD were doing? And I, and, and, and I well documented it. And this was also real interesting. And I didn't realize until at the end what that was about. When I was talking about the FBI, and I would talk and talk and talk, and I would, you know, sometimes pull out my book and give them a citation and all that type of stuff. Their thing to me was, but do you have the actual, a copy of the actual document? Huh? I wrote the damn book 26 years ago in my office right now. Do I have a copy of the damn documents? No, I don't have a copy of the documents. But that is what they needed in, uh, you know, from what I can gather now, that's what they needed in order to put it in the, you know, in order to, I guess, validate my statements about the FBI. Even if I'm reading directly from a document, they didn't want to hear it for legal reasons and all that type of stuff. But here's the thing. When it came to talking about the nation and all of the different, you know, all the garbage that the nation was doing, you didn't need no extra documents. They weren't asking for no damn FBI files and all that when it came to the nation, whatever you got to say, we want to hear it for the nation. But if you're going to talk about the FBI, we need for liability and legal reasons, we need to see some type of credible sources type of stuff. And it has to be the actual sources. No, that was a sure, you know, that really was a charade. Yeah. Um, and like I said, if I could take it back, I would take it back. My understanding is they're doing a second one. And they need not knock on my door. Not to mention the fact that there was nothing. And I, I want to make this point real clear because the more, you know, I've only been able to see this film one time. I mean, excuse me, one and a half times. I started seeing, okay, I saw it the first time and I was, you know, and the second time, you know, I couldn't see it. You know, I was watching it with my wife and we were watching for a little bit. And then I realized I started falling asleep. And then I realized it wasn't that I was tired, is that I did not want to waste no more time with this bullshit. Yeah. But, but, but here's the thing. There was nothing in that documentary that represented new information that had not already substantively been covered in my book. Nothing, nothing of substance. And Nothing. the same can be said about Manning's book. Yeah, because exactly. Manning is yeah. His goal and, yeah. and presented as his own idea of the theory of what happened, the actual players and so forth around Malcolm's assassination. And if I, uh, you know, I don't remember the quip exactly, but basically he said something to effect that all those books in the eighties didn't amount to much. Yeah. On page four ninety, <laughs> he says. Something to the effect that everything written in the 90s is irrelevant, yeah. which would include Baba Zat, sales. I mean, how I mean, yeah, yeah. right. But you hear, something, you hear something interesting? I talked to Marable maybe, maybe about a year or so, uh, before his book came out and he transitioned. And we were talking on the phone, and what Marable says to me is he says that 
you know, how much he appreciated my book. And he said that my book was the gold standard. So then I was real curious when his book came out to look to see what he said about my book or about me. And I think I'm a I think I'm a reference. I think I'm a reference somewhere in there. I'm like a I'm an end note. I'm a footnote or something like that. But it's like that's not what this guy. This guy's telling me, you know, you know your your analysis and your ability to penetrate issues and people. You know, he's giving me all this stuff. And then, like I said, there was like one. I saw I saw one reference, and that was it. You know, I I, I don't know. You know, <laughs> I mean, I didn't know Marable that well, but you know, I, I was kind of scratching my head a little bit on that one. Jared. Yeah. Can I can I add something just a little Please. bit um, just a little bit off of this point, um, and I want to go back to what um, Zach was saying earlier about a response. It was important, and I felt it was important that we do have a response to what came out, and it's this conversation verifies how important that that response was. The acknowledgement of this book so far. Uh, and I think it'll continue to be acknowledged as a response has been noted. We're like one millionth of the size of that publisher, you know, <laughs> but the work you guys did and all the work you guys contributed to actually made this happen. And that will live on as a response. I, I want to note, though, that in addition to our work, not only did we feel it important, I'm saying as That's a right. group, third world press did, too. So in other words, and we had no coordination on this. Initially, I did not know that Third World Press was going to work on a response. They didn't know that we were working on a response. We found that out later. Uh, for the record, though, I want to note that Jared, Todd, you guys set an editorial direction that was different than Third World Press. Yeah. And that editorial direction was to take on and critically, critically challenge many books. Third World Press and her boy, they took a different one. And I think just as important, they approached the, uh, the subject as a balance. They looked at those people who were uh, in favor of the book, those people who were opposed to the book, and mm -hmm. they brought those together. It's significant that um, both of those, uh, Third World Press and Black Classic Press, as precarious as our existence has been, still were the ones, because no white press has done this, no That's press right. still were the ones to offer a type of response and a critique to this major work that may be fiction or fictive. But I was thinking about this, Todd. Um, even if we go with it, that it's fiction, one of the things we got to say, it's the greatest piece of fiction that's ever been <laughs> 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 I was listening to everybody on the call. I think every person on this call, and certainly all the people, most of the people that I know politically, had their lives changed or touched or moved in some significant way by Malcolm X's book. And by That's right. So, so, so I just, I just wanted to add that dimension to it. And I want to tell you guys, this is a, a, a story too. I don't know how many people remember, but this is, this is to integrity, right? And Jared had to trust uh, to bring this to me. Tanahasi had written a piece on Malcolm X. On on uh, um, it wasn't even a, he was doing more a um, a piece on Obama and 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 Malcolm. And he was citing he got an early draft of um, of um, Manning's book. Mm. That was initially going to be included in this book. But as the, as the work went along, I think it was, uh, it, it didn't take that long, a, a month or two or something like Jared, Jared and um, Todd brought up the issue and, and they actually um, thought I would have a problem, I think, with it <laughs> because they had to be delicate to tell me that, well, Tanahasi's piece was not critical enough, so it wasn't going to make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we figured if it, the way I remember it is we figured if we were already, you know, our heads were already on the chopping block, why not go ahead and go all the way with it? Like, I mean, you know, it was difficult. I remember it being difficult, but at the same time, I mean, it would have been more difficult, I think, to not 
bring it up and to and to live with that because we did want to set that editorial mm -hmm. direction and and but 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 we were also responding to you because yeah. your first call to me Paul was hot yeah, yeah. I, you know I, we I'm not in your inner circle I'm not in your you know but I've been around you enough and I don't see you blowing up like I don't see oh, you no. emoting like that no. and in that call you were like look man no. No, like really. and, and to, to Baba Zach's point, you mentioned the Clark response to Styron and said you wanted this to be in that tradition. And I was and that was like that's pushing all of my buttons right there. So I was like it was like ding, ding. I was so. So anyway, and for those of you who don't know, um, John Clark asked me to republish that book and we did republish it. That's right. Republish it. OK, so he wanted the name changed. And, he, and the, the name was the Second Crucifixion That's of right. Nat Turner. Yeah. So that was done, you know, sometime before he died. And Jared, you're right. I do uh, remember, the, definitely, definitely remember that. I just think the leadership you and Todd exhibited in selecting the folks and setting the editorial direction uh, for this piece it makes it a hallmark and sets it among, and we all should be grateful for our association on this. Um, so I just thank you guys, you know? No, thank you. It, it, let me just welcome uh, our brother Eugene Perrier to the conversation, uh, fresh off of a lot of work, uh, breakthrough news, probably doing something with Party for Socialism and Liberation, causing trouble for somebody somewhere. Uh, Eugene, we've just been sort of reflecting on what brought us to this project, uh, uh, some of the response we've gotten or, or maybe not gotten is something we could talk about maybe in, in another round. Uh, but but any reflections uh, that, you know, initial thoughts on your participation in this book or responses you've gotten from being involved with this book or or just any anything in general? No. Well, I mean, first and foremost, just, to, you know, to thank you and, 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 uh, and, and Todd for allowing me to be a part of it. Uh, I was not even 100 percent sure I wanted to write something. You may not remember this, Jared, but I told you I was like working on something and I was like not clear. Was I going to do it? Was I not going to do it? And you said y'all were putting this volume together. And I said I had to do something. And it pushed me to really put it together because, I mean, the impact politically, the potential impact politically of the book. I mean, I remember when I got Manny Marable's book and I, I got it from someone who was like, this is the best book I've ever read. <laughs> and it to wow. so I immediately know that that is not case and i'm already and i'm like well you know what let me just save my attack on them until after i've read the book and the impact of it on me was was deep on a few different levels i mean one the just obvious heavy-handed political intervention that was designed to create a, a liberalized in i mean some of the things i couldn't even understand like the post script thing about osama bin laden like, what is this even <laughs> Like, 9-11 yeah. was 15, 13 years ago. Like, it just, you know, the, the, the nature of it was so ham-fisted that it just enraged me, really, in the context of what was going on here. Because, I, you know, I think, as, as, as you put it out there so correctly, Mr. Coates, I think the impact of the autobiography, whatever its flaws, the impact of the coming on of YouTube um, and, and the ability to sort of directly unmediated by others for younger people like myself to hear the voice and the thoughts of Malcolm X had had such a profound impact. Um, I've, I've, I've been privileged enough to travel around the world to areas where people are struggling. And you know, no matter what the language, no matter what the knowledge, no matter where it is, if people are struggling and fighting against oppression and for liberation, Malcolm X's image is there. Um, it's so relevant to so many people. I even saw today, the most famous communist politician in Brazil, which there means something, unlike America, um, offering an appreciation of, of Malcolm X. And just the depth of that is so big. So I was just terrified of what the impact of this book could be because it would have the imprimatur of Manny Marable, whatever else we think about him, that would open a lot of doors, um, that it just had the imprimatur of, of a major press, it was thick. Uh, and the impact that you know the Martin Duberman uh, biography of Paul Robeson has had. And I'm certainly less critical of that book than I am of this one. But I, having seen over the years how these so-called seminal biographies, I might make a similar argument against Black Against Empire about the Black Panther Party, but these seminal biographies that are put out by these uh, major publishing houses usually tend to have the, the ability to misdirect people's thoughts. And that's what led me to bring it. So uh, to want to be a part of the text, I would say just quickly in terms of the responses, 
I'm a little hesitant to say this, and maybe I'm going to say too much, but I feel like we won. I, 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 every person, focus, I, brother. <laughs> every person I have, have given live reinvention to has been like, wow, this is amazing. This is blowing my mind. I can't believe this. People who never read the book love it as a as a as a book in and of its own right. Because even though it's a book of critiques, it's also a book that's that people are offering their personal remembrances of Malcolm, mm -hmm. they're offering their their analytical uh, uh pieces of it. So you get a lot out of it, even if you never read the Marable book. And for those who did read the Marable book, it was like a breath of fresh air. Now, I don't know. I don't talk to everyone. I, But I do, in the course of my organizing, deal with a lot of people who are newly radicalizing. I still constantly, all the time, once every couple months, someone says, I read the autobiography. And that's a piece of how they were finding things. No one has ever told me as of yet that they have read the Marable book and that it made any impact on them whatsoever, that it moved them to do anything one way or the other. <laughs> I'm sure there are people out there for whom it did, and, and I, maybe I just don't move in the right circles and it's too narrow for me, but it seems to me that it was a failed intervention. And the fact that there are texts, the third world press piece, the live reinvention piece, that can give you a whole different reality and that are often available at many of our bookstores where you know the same things are happening or the suggestion thing on Amazon, I think has blunted the impact of well, I the extremely dangerous promotion of a, of a just, and that's the final thing I just say about this. Mm -hmm. As a non-scholar, the obvious, just a layperson, the obvious lack of analytical rigor and academic rigor in the book, which you would never be allowed to get away with if you weren't doing right. something that they wanted to see. I mean, obviously the most right. controversial issue in the book, the footnotes. Like it's one thing to just lie yeah. and or put a ridiculous yeah. footnote in there, but to put something in and then having your footnote essentially, I have no idea if this actually <laughs> happened, but a friend of a friend of a friend told a guy 20 years ago who told me when I interviewed him in 1989 in my notes. Um, so this means that Malcolm X is Y or Z. Whether he was at Y or Z, that is so irresponsible, it's yeah. unbelievable. And I think that speaks to <laughs> book was really all about and, and a lot of the pieces. But, you know, I'm honored to have, have been able to be a part of an intervention that was talking about the real Malcolm X and the real lineages and also the deeper piece of how propaganda is, is weaponized and used against right. us, even with the revolutionary heroes. Mm -hmm. No, right on. I, you know, I think a lot of good points you raised. One of them, I think one of the problems, and I'll, I'll just say this very quickly, is that that I don't think a lot of people actually read or read Marable's book. I think they were reacting to the popular reactions to Marable's book from their friends or their colleagues or some review somewhere, uh, uh, and were were which was I think by design meant to sort of blunt any pop potential criticism that would come. Uh, so when you when you offer up and say I have criticisms of the book, people be like, well, how could you? Because everybody says it's great and it's from Marable, but did you read the book? Well, I didn't actually read the book, but you know. Uh, uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's like, well, dang, I sat through and read the damn thing, 600 some pages, at least, I don't know, all of it one plus times and then several sections, many other times. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and, and I, I suffered through it and then you don't even read it. And, and, and anyway, Kali Akuno, uh, uh, one of the reasons I, I was very happy that you joined the project and I'm glad you could make it tonight among many other things, your long work now with Cooperation Jackson, Malcolm X grassroots movement and so on is, is that uh, uh, I thought it was great that someone relatively close to my age who actually reflects in real life the politics of Malcolm X should be involved. I mean, um, uh, uh, so many people talk about Malcolm. One of the pet peeves I have is that so many people that talk about Malcolm and other these great leaders don't actually like their politics. So here's someone who actually does like them and actually tries to live them. Anyway, so we're just talking about our early reflections of, of, of why we came to the project. Um. Uh, and any reactions that you've gotten having been involved with our, our uh, collection that you would want to share or any other thoughts that you might have, we're happy to hear. Well, first, uh, good to be here. Uh, second, apologize for being late. I'm trying to just do some some pain management. And I, I even had this down for tomorrow. So I showed you all off. Uh, I was in, in uh, trying to deal with this back. Um, second, uh, um, we haven't caught up in part because it's back, but thank you, Jared, for helping with that fundraiser, bro. I got the inverter, uh, and it's done wonders to get me to even be able to be back up 
and, and do this. Um, still, still hurts like hell every time I'm on it. Uh, yeah. But uh, I call it the truth serum. Um, well, I'm but, glad. To, I'm glad. And, and thanks everybody who contributed because I know exactly what you're going through. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Now, glad uh, for the project, I'm, I'm glad you're putting this together um, because as you know, and, and I've seen a little bit, uh, we got another set of historical fictions that's out there with this new movie. And it seems like every uh, generation that comes up, we get some new fictional uh, kind of Frankenstein uh, of our folks that we got to kind of deal with in one way or another. And that's how I always felt about that Manning book. Um, you know, I still maintain to this day, I don't know if y'all covered this because I came in late. I still maintain to this day um, that he didn't actually finish that book. Um, and that there were some other hands who didn't really care to fact check some points or to cross reference some of the things that was actually, you know, in that long book, um, which really made it a disaster. So I thought our piece then and, and now was uh, right on time. Uh, and now looking on it, you know, what's this, some, uh, almost 10 years later? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is uh, it? No. yeah, wow. That's almost yeah. 10 years ago, oh, dear. Uh, uh, don't seem like it, but yeah, it's about that long. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, this is just a period where, at least in my lifetime, I've never seen how the, the skill and the craft, uh, you know, that our enemies have just started to perfect of taking our own sheroes and heroes and totally using them against us, you know, just distorting their messages, distorting their politics. Uh, become, you know, mainstream. Uh, the fact that they even considering putting Harriet Tubman on U.S. currency and ain't nobody, you know, trying to burn the place down for such a sacrilege, but some, some Negroes out there praising it. Um, you know, that to me is just one of these points where the, the distortions are so acute that they are using us, our works, our words, our history against us to continue this this project, you know, this this imperial project of theirs, and folks are just kind of going along with it, you know, uh, that's very dangerous, uh, and I think it speaks to why we we kind of constantly have to do our best, even if it's in small venues, to correct the history, and and be clear and precise about what the politics of what people actually work for and sacrifice for, you know, uh, you know that's that's the the last piece that I would say uh, I just want to bring into this conversation for us to remember that and to put the dangers of this kind of revisionism in, in this actual context of how these things get, get weaponized against us if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. Hey, listen, everybody. We're 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 a little over an hour. I just want to time check. Uh, I don't obviously. I'm not rushing anybody anywhere. I just want to make sure if anybody has to go, that they get a chance to say any piece that they need to say. Uh, I have several other questions I definitely want to ask. If anybody has questions they want to ask or raise, please jump on in. Uh, uh, but yeah, anybody feel impressed in any kind of way, to any direction? Just checking the. I, I mean, I sure, wanted to bring up. I mean, something Kali referenced. You know, I mean, we we we've been talking a lot recently about the Hampton film, but then there was also the Nine in Miami film, which again mm -hmm. are these sort of well-made. Hollywood revisionist histories of our heroes. And, they, you know, they're done by, now. They, nowadays they're done by folks who look like us. They're done by folks who think they have an appreciation for that history. But again, they're done to, to normalize a certain discussion, to personalize these things in some way, to make them battles between individual personalities as opposed to these larger ideas around liberation, right? And I think that the characterization of Malcolm in that recent uh, movie, to me, again, was another way of trivializing Malcolm and what Malcolm was bringing to the movement and what Malcolm was even trying to do and having conversations with Muhammad Ali um, and helping to politicize him and others. So, you know, I, mm. I again, anytime mainstream 
uh, uh, white corporate media, uh, whether or not that's book publishing or movie uh, movie making, gets a hold of radical black radical culture or black radical ideas, their job is to tame it, to tantalize with it, um, to make it something. When, so when people hear or read these things, they're no longer thinking about um, revolutionary practice. Instead, they're sure. thinking about um, uh, small matters of of like what was the interceding interpersonal relationships between these people that led to this and led to that, as opposed to whole structure and hierarchy above, which were pulling the strings um, that led to these people being assassinated, um, redirected, movements being destroyed, as you had Drew Brown earlier talking about the Fred Hampton film and how the mistake people are making is thinking about Fred as the Messiah, as opposed to thinking about the Panther Party and how that was a piece of the party which was being, being targeted to be destroyed during that time period. And so I think mm. that's part of the history that we need to delve into and, and think about um, and talk about, you know, for the audience that we have around who, you know, who these pieces are for and what their ultimate goal is in creating them. It's now, funny you say that. I'm sorry, go ahead, please, go no, ahead. No, my question was whether or not we're gonna see the same thing in the United States versus Lady Day. I haven't seen it. I saw an interview. The interview that I saw of Lee Daniels for me was a little bit disturbing. But again, I haven't seen the film, so I can't I can't comment on it. Um, but it was interesting to me that that part of discussion, uh, um, Kamal, you made the point uh, about let's dig into these little personal relationships. Let's see what's going on. What what kind of salacious information can we come up with? And it was interesting to me as he presented this film. He talked about we need to do this because we have to celebrate the fact that she was a queer woman and that that's not something that um, people focus on. But we need to focus on that. So we embracing her as, as a queer, queer woman. And I asked myself, what part of that story is necessary? What part of that tale is necessary in order to put out the, the true story, quote unquote, of how the United States used her, went after her and really criminalized her? as a result of her drug use or whatever case may be. But again, I haven't seen the film, and so I can't say what the outcome is going to be. But the point that Kali made earlier is that you don't have to have the power, white power structure um, to make these films that distort the true meaning uh, of the story. Our own folks are doing it for us, or they're doing it to us. Maybe it's a better way to put it. If the butler is an indication, we are in trouble for sure. Uh, um, one point, I don't know if any of you saw the press conference yesterday, uh, but I watched the press conference led by attorney Ben Crump and, and the, uh, uh, nephew of Raymond Wood, who was the deathbed confessing agent who was involved in setting up both, um, uh, now I'm forgetting, was he involved with, um, Oh, now the Black Liberal, okay, he, he was involved sure. in, yeah, he was, in the uh, New York February, 21, Malcolm, sorry, right. Right. Yeah. But, but, the uh, Black but, Liberation Front, uh, about two weeks before Malcolm was killed, he was involved in that. Setting right. Them up. So I just want to set this up by saying that, that, to Kamal's point, I saw in the press conference a lot of the same thing that I think happens in these, these dramatized uh, uh, commercial products. That is... The, the whole context, from my point of view, of the press conference was to sanitize the, the brother, uh, Raymond Wood, to, to sort of humanize him, uh, mm -hmm. talk about the stresses and the, the, the way he was used by the state to snitch on others, um, and that the, 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 the nephew was saying this was a chance to cleanse his family's name, to apologize to, to, the, to the daughters of Malcolm X, to apologize, and then... They literally end it by well, his part by saying uh, 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 this is the greatest country in the world. And then he, he wraps up by saying, God bless America. And I remember and they're in the Autobahn <laughs> and I'm saying everything that Malcolm fought for is worse today than when he was alive. And yet we're talking as if this is an apology to someone who has won and not not a, a, a confession to a community that is losing. Um, anyway, that, anyway, so I, and yet it was, anyway, so I, anyway, did any of you see that or have any reflection? And then of course they mentioned, by the way, the brother Thomas, uh, Johnson, that, that Kamau, you, you worked for, uh, briefly as, as an attorney. 
So I thought the and you know with anyway, uh, Baba Zach, go ahead. Did you did you? Yeah, you yeah. I saw the first thirty, maybe 25, 30 minutes. I I had a program and I was able to watch, and then I had to you know switch off after thirty minutes or so. Uh, it was uh, the part that I saw was fascinating. And the thing that stands out the most to me, uh, in the beginning, though, you know, it, it was a lot of pomp and circumstance and, you know, just, you know, just, just silliness in the beginning. You know, Crump was kind of like facilitating it and, you know. But here's the thing. This is what caught me. When I left, the nephew was talking. And um, he said something that, you know, I was with my wife and he said something. And I think we both just burst. Well, I don't know if she burst, but I burst out laughing. This is what he said. He was talking about his uncle. He said his uncle was forced to do what he did. In other words, he said his uncle was forced to betray our struggle. Now, I left, and I don't know if he defined the word forced like i don't know if he was saying that the enemy put a you know put a gun mm -hmm. to his uncle's head and said if you don't do what we want you to do we're gonna you know we're we gonna waste your family or something i don't know how he was defining force but when I was I hired, that, he was hired recruited and told to do a job that's what right. he meant and that was, uh, let me let me read and, what he said that's force that's force. um what wood says in the letter unbelievable what Wood, what Wood says precisely in the letter is that his actions on behalf of New York City Police Department boss was done under duress and fear. And then he adds direct quote, detrimental, and that he could face detrimental consequences if he did not follow the orders of his handlers. <laughs> now, 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 Paul Coates, <laughs> when people in struggle in the Black Panther Party, just as an example, under duress <laughs> and under fear that if they did not succeed in their mission, their life might be in danger. I mean, is it is 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 that to me? That to me is more, you know. Anyway, that, but he did he did suggest he did suggest in the press conference that had he not performed those duties, the uh, police officers, the police department, which to be fair, there is some justification yeah. for this that the NYPD would have done him dirty. Um, oh, he, he definitely that, says that they were going to pin charges on him. And that they beat people up in his presence and then suggested to him that if he doesn't go along, he will find himself uh, yeah. charged with marijuana and alcohol trafficking. <laughs> and I mean, let, let's be clear. That's probably all true. But it still yeah. doesn't justify his actions. It's right? yeah, because technically. But it's all, all true, probably. Right. All he's saying is what William O'Neill said mm. in the Fred Hampton thing. Because remember. They got him on a petty ass charge, and then they used that to basically white mail him for the next couple of years and stuff. And they paid him. So this is my problem. My problem is, is that, you know, you're trying to water this down. Like the nephew was watering this down. Right. And in his letter, my wife just showed me the letter a second ago, and they're watering it down. You know, he's saying, you know, I, you know, out of fear of threat, and, and they're gonna do mm -hmm. X and Y. We need to stop playing these silly ass games. You made a decision to betray your people, to betray these brothers and sisters in these organizations. Mm -hmm. Admit it, live up to it, take your blows. We don't need to hear all these excuses. He was forced. Wow. Okay. Well, but the news did well, break that apparently the the, fe the Malcolm's daughters are using this to to call for a relaunch of an investigation yeah. into their father's mm -hmm. assassination. So, yeah. so if you want to say something good has come out of it, maybe I don't know. Sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say quickly. I mean, it's not like we expect the the the, the <laughs> investigation to do anything more than what it's right. done, but to lead to a right. further cover up. And and and, and that's name with that's Biden name, and man. Harris in, in there. Come on, man. <laughs> and that's no blame to the family that's looking for justice, I guess. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's another critique of Malcolm's family, Martin's family, uh, and the and and the, the, the attempt to mainstream folks for various reasons that we can get into, of course. 
But obviously, folks are searching for justice. It's just that you can't expect the very people who assassinated your father to admit that they assassinated him um, and put themselves on trial for it. Um, so we know that that is not is that's not going to be what's going to come out of this at all. So I mean, I think you know, and, and you mentioned you know my my brief representation of Johnson was around Johnson wanting to clear his name, uh, right? Johnson, uh, uh, who was one of the people who was convicted of Malcolm's assassination, and it was you know it was a very it was a short time. He passed shortly thereafter. Um, he was brought to me by a, a friend who was doing a documentary on his life. Um, and even though, you know, certain things I, I, I can't still reveal, you know, it was a hard decision to make because even though he wasn't, uh, he is his claim, obviously, that he was not involved in the assassination. There are other things that we know the nation was doing um, mm -hmm. that he clearly took part in that that was disturbing, horrifying and harassing to Malcolm's family. So, you know, we can't forget, you know, as we, we uh, definitely as we talked in this, Bob Azak talked about earlier, that the role that the nation played, uh, mm -hmm. not only the role of the federal government in terms of duping members and infiltrating and so forth and so on, but uh, the role that the nation played in terms of trying to um, keep Malcolm from further politically radicalizing the nation, um, as opposed to having it remain or be a religious organization that could survive uh, and have its top members strive was something that clearly went into the calculus for why uh, the federal government knew that they were openings in the first place to do the damage that it mm -hmm. wanted to do uh, to Malcolm and to that organization. And that's really important. By the way, I, I'm certainly no expert, but it, but from watching the documentary Wormwood so many times, which I keep recommending, when 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 they talk about the the, the federal government killing Frank Olson, I believe. Uh, um, the the, what, the the point to your, to your point about not counting on the government to kill you and then prosecute themselves. Uh, what comes out in that documentary apparently is that if the government does kill you, as they did with Frank Olson throwing him out of a of a hotel window to protect their secrets, they can't be prosecuted and there's nothing you can do. But if they kill you by accident, uh, then you could maybe. Uh, uh, they can, you know, maybe there could be a, a, a some follow up or something. But but apparently, if the federal government kills you on purpose, there's no, there there is no recourse uh, that you can take legally no, or I otherwise. Mean, the federal so. government does a sloppy job and kills you on purpose, as in Fred Hampton's case. There's small remuneration to be okay. made after twenty or thirty years of trying. Right? I mean, if the if if the documentation is so clear and it's easier for them to pay to pay something, then they can, okay. they they will do that. Right? Um, and in Malcolm's case, it's such a, uh, relatively speaking, uh, uh, it was a well done assassination in terms of right. where the blame was laid for dozens of years before, um, uh, before, jo um, um, uh, Th Thomas Hayer, I mean, uh, Norman Butler's, uh, affidavit that first came out and started talking about, um, that these, that the others who were convicted weren't the real uh, folks who were there when mm -hmm. Baba uh, Zach's book came out and laid out that story and that history and used documentation, you know, but yet there is no quote unquote smoking gun as in, you know, we are going to do ABC to Malcolm on ABC day. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a harder case to make anyway. But clearly, you know, in this particular case, this, uh, the assassination of Malcolm X, uh, uh, even if at the time within the movement context, it wasn't considered the seminal moment that it was because it was played down, right? And mainstream civil rights leaders um, and mainstream newspapers treated it as an offshoot of a violent organizing nationalist movement. It is obvious that Malcolm's assassination was one of the most pivotal moments of the redirection of the history of that time period that we can calculate because of what the possibilities of Malcolm mobilizing around a revolutionary nationalist context, both here at home and internationally, um, was something that they had to stop. Well, but Netflix said the lone gunman is dead, so it's a wrap anyway. So I guess, unfortunately <laughs> for everybody involved, that's an end of the story because Netflix. <laughs> uh, was somebody trying to jump in? Anybody? Any thoughts on any of that? Jared, I, I would just say real quick, I mean, I, I agree with to me, one thing I'm, I'm concerned about is even the impact of this continued search for the revelation around the smoking gun. I mean, could you possibly have more evidence of what took place? And whether or not there is some 
you know, subsidiary argument about how exactly it, it went forward. I mean, can anyone really look at everything that is there and raise the point with any justification that this was just sort of fratricidal violence between rival gangs is the way they wanted to seem. I don't think there's any way you can really read it in that way if you really read what's available. And I think the continued focus and promotion of, you know, I mean, the Crump press conference, the Netflix documentary, of the idea that there's some sort of rock to turn over here, and that by turning over this mm. rock, we will ultimately know the government is responsible. Well, what will that really change between us knowing the government is responsible now? And having the exact uh, smoking gun, and looking at the entire, you know, consequence and and context around so many revolutionary people who have been cut down before their heyday, the chemical warfare that has been used. You know, that's an issue we don't really want to talk a lot about. But you know, Kwame Ture, I think, raises it very well in his memoir, the impact of of uh, you know uh, cancer on so many veterans and what that could at least potentially mean. That's why they threw Frank Olson out that window. Biological exactly. warfare. That was exactly the point. <laughs> and to me, it feels it, it, it's an impact of capitalist, mm -hmm. imperialist hegemony on our minds that somehow maybe there was some other explanation. That somehow the government maybe isn't that bad. That they would never do anything that is that brazen or that mm -hmm. wild or that crazy or however people put it. And so I almost feel the whole conversation and the whole song and dance that can constantly create new books, constantly create new movies, constantly create new press conferences about a smoking gun is really just misdirecting us from the overall legacy of Malcolm X. And I think re really redirecting us from understanding the role he was playing and why he was such a threat to the establishment, why he was such a threat to people around the world who obviously wanted him dead. And to me, that's the axis of it. So I didn't even watch the press conference. I was confused when I first saw it on Twitter. I thought someone was sharing old news. I was like, I thought we already knew this, that the NYPD and the FBI was involved. Then I figured out it was something new. And I said, well, what's the point? Because we're gonna keep having these conversations. And to me, it's a misdirection play from where we really need to be. And I think just the, the industrial assassination industrial complex that has pushed this on so many different levels for so many different people. Um, uh, I, I think we some of it is irrelevant and important, but at this stage in the game, I feel we have most of it. Some of the people on this call have provided this information. And so why are we constantly revisiting this? I think that's a question I've been asking myself a lot after this press conference. Mm. Uh, there was so one thing. thing. I, I mean, one okay. thing. I'll, oh, go. <laughs> one thing I'll just add on. Sorry about that. To, to no problem. Last point. <laughs> it, it it actually ignores what Malcolm himself told us, and what he instructed us. He was very clear. At least we all forget. But just saying this for this audience that may be you know new mm -hmm. to hearing this. He said I wasn't. You know the, the NOI didn't poison me when I was uh, on my international travels. Don't have mm -hmm. the capacity. Don't have the knowledge, don't have the reach. Uh, so it was very clear, you know, from the beginning that that was the U.S. government. That was never uh, uh, any mystery or secret about that to Malcolm. Uh, he was very clear uh, that there was some willing accomplices, unfortunately, in the NOI who wanted to see him gone for some, for really a kind of advancing on personal interest. But he spoke very clearly uh, in the autobiography, which yeah. we all remember about his own knowledge and his own uh, dealings uh, uh, with the, the, the FBI and, and other agencies uh, where they were approaching and, and uh, working with uh, the NOI uh, uh, and with Elijah Muhammad and doing some, some consultation. I think, you know, this is one of the things going back to, to, to Manny's book, like people wanted to drum up things that we already knew and were clearly, you know, to told by the source. Uh, and we're informed about. And I think when we do that, going back on even to your point, Eugene, we want, we miss the lessons or trying to deflect what we actually know about who the enemy is and what his interests are. You know, and some of that has to do with, I think, people playing the continued role of uh, provocateur. I just hope they're getting paid for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we got a lot of folks who just want to make the American project a little better, a little sweeter. Uh, and, and, and just try to put it off as if the facts that we know actually don't add up. You know, try to deny it so that it weakens our politics and our political position and our overall opposition to this project and what it's aiming to do and what it is doing actively to to us and the people all over the world. So I don't think that's just a misdirect. That's that's on purpose. That's a manufactured, you know, industry that mm -hmm. they got going 
to keep kind of drumming stuff off to, to, to it be smoke and mirrors when you actually knew from the very beginning, uh, um, you know, who the enemy was, what they were capable of doing and what they planned on doing from, from the beginning. Dr. Breed Merritt, you wanted to get in? My point or, was what I wanted to raise is really the question now is how do we move forward? How do we move this conversation forward? How do we move our activism forward? Um, what kinds of things, what direction do we need to go in to keep moving forward rather than, you know, as, as Eugene suggested, there's no need to rehash some of the things that we already know and we know quite well. Uh, we all did a great job in our response to Manning's book, but what does that mean for us now? What does that mean for the community, for the masses? What is it that we're doing to move forward, move the direction of, of the conversation forward, but also again, what, whatever kind of activism we may be involved in. Baba Zach, you had your hand up? You yeah, yeah, up? actually though, know, I'm, I'm kind of going, um, <laughs> I'm kind of going back to what the mama was just talking about. Uh, us moving forward from, but what I, what I wanted to say is that there was one substantive element that came out yesterday that I saw before I left, and that was that supposedly in the I, I guess it was in the letter that the guy le you know that uh, Raymond Woods left. That's that's worth somebody like me anyway. I'm going to have to follow this particular point up. But what they basically said in the letter, what he said, is that there was a concerted effort about the week or two before Malcolm's assassination that the NYPD and the FBI were purposely um, rounding up and arresting on Trump charges and different mm. things like that some of Malcolm's main security mm -hmm. people. And so that's something that I I know that I will have to look into that to see whether or not, you know, we can we can validate that. But if that's true, then obviously the significance of that is that if you study any of the assassinations of the 60s that involved, you know, that had the United States government's imprint, most notably, if you look at the John Kennedy assassination, if you look at the King assassination, and I talk about this in my Malcolm book as well, but not, you know, if this is true, then obviously I'm going to be able to add to that, you know, to the uh, complexity of it. But one of the major features leading up to the King assassination and the JFK assassination is they compromise their security. Mm -hmm. Now, we talk about it in my Malcolm book to the extent that, um, they wasn't checking people at the door. Malcolm had amateurs acting like they were, you know, you know, bodyguards and different things like that. That compromised Malcolm's security. Didn't have guns there, uh, you know, you know, different things like that. But this is significant because what we already know is that the enemy has consistently shown that when they do assassinate, it's been a standard practice for them to mm -hmm. compromise the security of the target uh, leading up to and, uh, and at the moment of the assassination. So, so to infiltrate, not just compromise. Mm -hmm. so, so can I well, but, well you, you know what? Historically, they don't even, historically, if you study the Kennedy assassination and if you study the King assassination, in, in those cases, because the enemy technically particularly in the king says it they were providing the security so all they had yeah. to do there is just to pull their yeah. people back they didn't necessarily have to have you know agent provocateurs or anything like that even though technically they did have that if you look at the king assassination they had a guy by the name of uh, mcculloch who had basically infiltrated the invaders which was one of the organizations mm -hmm. that right. was that was thoroughly thoroughly infiltrated and in fact, they're the ones that created the mini riot. The chaos, right. Right. The so called mini riot the week before the assassination. Yeah. But now we're going into some other stuff. So, so, so Zach, here, here's a question that I, you know, and my whole frustration with, with this so called deathbed confession. <laughs> how do you, how do you, you've spent so much time working, trying to uncover truth. How do you even trust a supposed letter? 
from somebody who has lived in the midst of lies, who has lived in the midst of betrayal for five decades. You know, <laughs> what supposedly makes any truth? Can I, got to say. Right. Can I just add one? How are you going to navigate that? You know, <laughs> just, that's a good question, Paul. And, and I, I want to answer. You, uh -huh. I mean, look. <laughs> I mean, come on! How how are you going to be able to collaborate? But just as a, I don't understand it. Because just as a point, every day, every day of their lives to last fifty years. <laughs> so how do we trust what they suppose? Right. Okay. I want to address. I want to address. But that, Bob, is that before you, you want to say something? I, I just want to clarify, just so that we're clear that that on the claim on during the press conference, they brought right. a woman up. And I forget her exact relationship, but they claimed that the deathbed confession was made some 10 plus years ago. Right. He recovered. Uh, and in the time between his recovery, he had made them promise not to share it until he actually died. And in the time during that recovery, this woman and some apparent team. Right. She was supposedly a researcher. She was supposedly right. a researcher. And mm -hmm. she claimed that she did claim a team researched to verify they didn't explain right. any of this or right. lay any of that but, but anyway but, sorry go ahead about that yeah uh, but to answer your question uh paul are you asking how can you trust somebody who's been lying for yeah, like in, a, in I'm decades of scholar i'm saying right I, I got you but here's yeah. the thing um you don't yeah right you right. don't you it's presuppose there, that they're lying but then what you do though is you go about the business of seeing to what extent can you collaborate? And basically all somebody like me would try to do, I would try to eliminate the possibilities, Okay. you know, as if it did, you know, as if it happened and stuff. Now, how successful am I going to be wasting my time? Uh, it's likely. But just the other thing, though, Paul, what I'm really going to, uh, I'm going to take a shortcut, though. Mm -hmm. And the shortcut is, I want to go back to the FBI files and see whether or not there was something in there that I missed, you know, 20 years, 20 something years ago when I was really reading these files like every day and stuff like that, you know, because, you know, after a while, you know, you, you don't see everything, not when you're all together looking at, I don't know, 30,000 files all the way together, something like that. So, you know, so all, all that to say, I'm just going to give it a shot, but your skepticism, well taken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did anybody else have a pressing point or or, or comment? Uh, 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 Kali, I think you raised something in the private chat that that is worthy of bringing up. If if nobody has a pressing uh, um, point, if you want to raise it, please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, in, on this piece about where do we go from here and go forward? Um. You know, one of the things that that unfortunately, uh, in my view, you know, we see uh, elements of our people's politics going backward. You know, and some of that is is well funded and well sourced uh, as to to why it's going there. But um, to put it in the context and the framework of of where you know Malcolm was was pointing us to. Um, you know, is that the, the, the need for us to build a Pan-African perspective mm -hmm. uh, uh, and revolutionary program and practice, that has never waned. Uh, it's, it's different now, you know, because you, you, we now have, what, 50 plus years of uh, all the pitfalls of, of national consciousness that, that uh, Brother Fanon warned us about with all the conflicts and everything that has occurred, you know, in the Caribbean and, and on the continent, um, you know, and now we got uh, ADOS, you know, uh, which has kind of emerged from the, the U.S. context uh, that is challenging and really trying to negate a lot of that history uh, that connects our people. And I think this is something that we both need to, ch you know, challenge uh, and correct and to speak to the broader necessity as to why Still in the 21st century, the need for us to connect with our folks, whether they in the Caribbean or Central America or South America or Europe uh, on the continent, and now even held increasingly in, in parts of Asia, 
you know, mm -hmm. uh, all over in China and Japan, uh, there's still a, a critical need, a dire need uh, for us to build some practical operational unity amongst our folks, you know, uh, uh, to further the liberation project. Um, this is one of the key things I think that Malcolm, if he was still here, would be pointing us to, slapping us in the head about, you know, get y'all get your act together uh, uh, and make this happen, particularly given that we have some tools and things at our disposal now that weren't around 50 years ago, like this tool we're using now uh, that can facilitate a, a greater degree of, of direct connection and communication albeit with limits, certain things you definitely should not touch on and explore in any of these things. But uh, at least in terms of building some relationships and staying up in, in, uh, with what's happening with each other, uh, this can be a greater facilitating tool to do that. Um, and I don't see us, you know, doing enough of it. And I'm, I think I'm still one of the people who, who's kind of up on a lot of what's happening within our, our movement, even if I can't directly uh, participate in it because of, you know, limitations of time, space, and energy. Uh, but I'm not seeing enough of where I think we need to go. I'm seeing some things going in reverse uh, on many different fronts. And I think that's something we need to continue to to press forward, you know, trying to figure out the question uh, uh, the Dr. The Reed Merritt asked, of, well, where do we go from here? What's the future? What's our what's our program? Uh, and that's mm -hmm. just one particular piece that I think we we definitely need to figure out and, and uh, combat because it's some of these things that, that I see coming out of uh, ADOS, you know, it, it really undermines a lot of our history, you know, because uh, like, look, following that, some of the formulas and stuff I've seen, uh, given Malcolm's uh, uh, partial Caribbean parentage, hmm. we've been talking to, about him. Uh, 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 you let some of them tell it, right? Well, they had literally created a meme that said that that uh, um, the female founder is is an improvement upon Malcolm X. They literally said she's better than Malcolm. So we might have just wow. lost that wing for at least the time being. We might have to just build. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. This is one thing I've been arguing with 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 Sister Tiny. We've been to see with Chimaranga, bring her into space. You know, she's been talking about. Uh, uh, we've been having a little sub debate about. She's saying that, that, that in particular, the New African independence movement, that wing of our movement should be, you know, recruiting these folks who made us. And I'm saying now, Tandy, unfortunately, yeah. that, that's that they want to be Americans, right? And 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 they are fully accepting of the American project. So they ain't with us striving for for independence and and you know uh, uh, self determination. They're going in the opposite direction. So we need to be very clear about that as as to why they are trying to join. Uh, the American Project. Why are you trying to stick your head in here, Io? I don't know. <laughs> you, you, uh, you know, uh, Brother uh, Kali, I, I think there's a couple of things here. One is that you're right in terms of the leadership. Um, I've run into some very young grassroots people in ADOS, and they lack political education. Many of these, and this is the thing that we have to confront, they actually have a working class base. Most of the organizations in the Black Liberation Movement do not. We're full of petty bourgeois, and we suffer from uh, the inherent limitations of a petty bourgeois person. So we have to try and confront the question, of why were they able to penetrate the masses? And it's not just the funding that they're getting from, uh, the, from, from uh, the capitalist class, and particularly Trump's folk. There's something else that they're able to communicate that we don't. We also have to find a way to talk more intelligently in terms of the class basis of the international Africans, the black immigrants that are here from the Caribbean and Africa, because at the level of, of a, a social interaction, there's very little and what there and what exists is hostile. So we've got to really work on trying to, you know, there was a moment when the people who came from the continent here were revolutionaries. People who come now are the petty bourgeois, the people who support the neo-colonial regimes broadly. So we've got to find a way to find the revolutionary colonel within that second generation of black immigrants and get them into greater interaction with us because that first generation is for the most part disconnected 
from us. And only when we're able to do that and make some kind of connection to the working class, because it, it just, I'm, I'm shocked. No matter what city I go in, when ADO shows up to disrupt, it's working class people. And they've bought into that argument. And so we've got to ask ourselves, what is more appealing to them on that argument? It's a strong anti-left argument that they're pushing, but somehow they're tapping into the poor sectors of our community in ways that we are unable to do. Well, let me or have uh, failed to do, I'll put it that way. I mean, I'm going to deposit let me deposit a couple of quick things. One, I think that element has always been there. In fact, the nation in some ways represents some of that element, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that element of black organizing has always been there, which is uh, more of a, um, uh, and some of it is uh, understandable in terms of a, uh, we're here, let's get what we can um, and make the best out of it and improve our lives, right? Uh, a la Booker T. Washington and so forth and so mm -hmm. on. At the same time, I think the other element that is, that is in terms of which way forward and something that Malcolm talked about in 63 is the, is the liberal element, which has dominated the, the so-called movement um, and has been paid to dominate the so-called movement mm -hmm. that has captured radical language. They use terms like self-determination. They use terms like radical, right? They point to, they yeah. agree with us on several different issues, some of them good issues. But yeah. time and time yeah. again, their base is to get us to vote for the Democratic Party as the way forward in which we will get our mm -hmm. liberation. They'll use the word liberation. You had uh, the, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter wrote a letter to Biden uh, after he won saying, I'm, I can't wait to talk to you about black liberation. I was, I mean, that was the most ridiculous thing I think I've ever heard. It's like that, that's the like.